Good morning. You can be seated. I have a real special treat for us today. Uh, how many remember Brother Joe Riley? Know Brother Joe Riley? This is his son, Brother Dawson Riley. And if you've listened to many of Brother Brown's tapes, you'll find Brother Brown talking about Brother Dawson and him going on hunts and different things like that. Well, when I first met Brother Branham in the 60s, and he'd tell me some of the hunting stories, and I was so envious, I thought, Lord, I'm going to meet them people. They're going to be my friends one of these days. And so this is one of my very special friends, Dawson Riley, Earl Williams, all those people that I ever never dreamed God would allow to cross our path. And here... Brother Dawson's come this morning. I've asked him to give his testimony. He's not a minister, but it took a little, little pressure, not a whole lot, you know. I don't know if Dawson's ever done this. Have you ever done this before? Not many times. He's my type of man. He loves hunting and he loves the wilderness. And and so I'm going to turn the service over to him, and I want him to take the whole service. I want it videoed. Your children are going to hear things. I'm going to hear things that I've not heard before either of some of the times and how, how he hunted with Brother Branham and how the Lord would reveal things and it would take place and, and different things like that to let you know that and this same God today is amongst us. See, Jesus, the Word, is amongst us. The Word and Spirit, the Word couldn't be here in our hour without the Spirit being with it, because they're one. The Word and Spirit are one. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have him come by. My mind and heart has been on him for the last month, and I'm trying to get numbers to call him, and he's been feeling the same way. So I believe, once again, our steps are directed to the Lord. And so at this time, I want to turn the service to Brother Dawson Riley and let him come and share his testimony. And uh, I know you're going to leave here blessed. By the way, Brother Dawson's only a couple of years younger than me. He may look younger than what he is. He's 62. I'm 64. And a miraculous miracle God did in his body healed him of cancer, cancer on his ear, just because he believed the Word of God. And so, Brother Dawson, if you'd come at this time, I'd like to turn the service to you. My precious friend. Just stand right there. Okay. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a minister, and I'm nervous because I don't do this. But... I was driving along yesterday morning in Idaho where I live. I had no thought of even being here. I didn't even think I could make it. I had to drive all night and the Lord spoke to me and asked me to come today. And I didn't know that he would speak to Brother Jim. He said he, he spoke to my heart that someone needed a little lift and I just came to visit brother Jim and he asked me to do this and I, these things are very dear to me the most precious thing in my life that's ever happened to me so I you'll forgive me if I'm emotional and I I'm a, a lion hunting guide I I still guide for a living and I'm about to start my lion hunts and uh, I don't know why he sent me he did I know that he did I got in here about three or four this morning and they're very precious friends of mine very dear to me and they the first day I met brother Jim we we became bosom friends and all through the years we've remained that way so I, I greet you and 
it's a pr pleasure for me to be and a privilege for me to be here. And I've jotted down a few things and probably more than more things kept coming to my mind in the back room and I jotted them down of things that went on. But before I do that, I'd like to testify of a wonderful thing that happened in my life. I've always been living in the outdoors and, and very, uh, I've had a very healthy life. Everything's been wonderful for health for me. And I went to Canada summer before last to work. And I'd finished my lion hunts in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I took a construction job. Uh, hunting doesn't do much in the summer, as you know. And so I took a construction job way up in the Arctic Circle and I started having some troubles. And we were working seven days a week, 11 hours a day, and I'm, I'm no kid anymore, and the old, the old equipment, heavy equipment was jarring me around, and I got, I knew I was, something was wrong, but I didn't know what. So I came home to Idaho, and I told my wife, I said, I've gotta go to the doctor, which I, I didn't even have a family physician because I've never been to the hospital, I've never been sick. I didn't even have a doctor. So I went into a little clinic there. I live in a remote portion of Idaho. It's kind of like a paradise, you know. It's, it's really a nice place. And uh, I went to this little clinic and this doctor said, well, you are have got to go see a specialist tomorrow, you're in real trouble. I can't tell you very much because I'm just a little clinic doctor, but tomorrow I set you, I'll get you in to a specialist. Well, I went over to Idaho Falls and the man told me, and he says, is your wife here? I said, yeah, she's in the, in the waiting room. He says, go bring her in. You're going to die. You get your things in order. You have let this go too long. You're, you're in serious trouble. You've got cancer, and I can't help you. So, I brought my wife in. You always think it happens to somebody else. I went from perfect health to, he says, I'm going to die. So I said, well, I'm ready. But... I didn't have things very good for my wife and daughter. I realized I didn't have things very, very good. So he told me what to expect, that he couldn't help me at all, but he could fry me and cook me and, and, and you know, do all the chemo and all this. I said, I'm going to go home and think about it. So I went home pretty much in shock for four days. I had about 20 five lion hunts booked and I was about to go. I had taken deposits on these hunts and probably spent most of it. But I thought, what am I gonna do? He told me my strength would fail. He told me that my endurance would wane and that when I told him what I did for a living, he says, there's no one way in the world you can do this. It's impossible. I was on snowshoes 90 days of a winter in four foot of snow, chasing my hounds, treeing these lions, and he said, it's an impossibility. He says, there's no way your body will stand up to that. So I went home, and four days, I just walked. I paced, and, and I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna go to camp. I, if I die, you'll know I died doing what I love to do. I, I, I don't feel like I'm going to die. And so he, he prescribed these treatments and they were horrible. If, he, if I told you what he told me he wanted to do, I mean, it was shocking to me, you know. So I didn't, I went home and, and, and got ready. I started getting ready to go to Jackson Hole to start my, up on the hole back, to start my hunts. So I went in and he said these shots were going to be $600 a piece and, and that I ought to go have chemo and I ought to have all of these other things. Well, I, I, I've never considered myself a man of faith, 
but I've always trusted the Lord. And, and I've lived in the wilderness for a, a several years to get away from people. <laughs> I'll admit it, you know, I just lived, uh, I liked it out there. I didn't have any neighbors. I, we didn't have any fellowship, and I'll, quite frankly, I'll, I'll admit I missed some fellowship, but I, what, I had peace. I had peace in my home. I had peace in my heart. And I spent more time in the message than I'd ever spent. And, and of course, I had, probably had less money than I ever had, but I had a whole lot better. Uh, everything was better. So, I told her that I was going to trust the Lord and that I wasn't going to have any treatments. And I went in to see him and I had, a, had had my ear frostbit and it was very angry and I think I got it frostbit about four times. It's 30, 40 below up at Jackson where I hunt. And, and uh, I ride a mule until the snow gets too deep and then I get it on a snow machine. So I got it frostbit and every time I did, a little more flesh would slough off the cartilage. And pretty soon he said, I, it won't heal, you haven't got anything to heal. So he says, we're gonna have to cut that off, probably about half of it. And I said, well, just whack it off. If I, I said, I'd do it with my knife, I could reach it, but I said, I, I, I don't know how to, I can't see good enough, so just go ahead and cut it off. And he, he said, uh, all right. So he had his nurse take some pictures of it, and it was very big, and, and I told him, just give me the Spock look, you know. And I said, that'd be all right. <laughs> you know, I never, so anyway, he says, uh, he says, let me, uh, let me, he scheduled me in for surgery about six weeks, five, five, maybe five. Well, I told my wife, I said, you know, I was in camp. She was at home, and she said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll just, I'll have to catch my lion early. I have five-day hunts. I book a hunter for five days, and if I can catch him early in the hunt, then I get a day or two off. I says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to catch a lion in one or two days and send my hunter home, so I'll have three days, and I'll go get my ear whacked off, and then I'll have maybe one day of rest before I go back to work. So... She says, well, how is it? And I said, you know what? I think it's healed. I, it's getting better every day, and I'm not bleeding on my pillow like I was. I think I'm getting healed. It, and so I said, you know, if it's healing here, it's healing in here. You know, my, I, had, yes. I had prostate real bad, you know. And I said, I think I'm, I think I'm getting healed already. Sure. And Amen. so when I went in for the surgery, he said, something's wrong. Something's I said, no, something's right. He said, look at the nurse, bring me those pictures. Well, they showed these big, this big angry deal, and here it's a little thing like a dime. He said, cancer doesn't heal. And he said, something's different. He said, it's better than when you came in here. I said, yes, sir, it is. And I told him that I'd been praying. So... He went ahead and he didn't, as, my, as you can see, my ear didn't get whacked off and there's no cancer there. Amen. And, uh, and, I, and, and I haven't had any sickness. I had no weakness. I had the best lion season I had ever had in my life for, since 1963. I, I, I filled 28 hunters, one every five days, the whole, and he gave me bountiful blessings. I had the finest winter I ever had. Uh, every time the other hunters would complain about not finding lion, I would catch two or three. I had eight days I filled on the first day. I had five multiple lion days. I had one three lion day. And all of those things, do, they don't happen to very many people. And I'm supposed to be getting older and slower, and the kids are supposed to be getting better, and I would just be blessed me. And I want to throw another little testimony in here. I had heard a lot of stories about how bad moose are, but I had never had any problems. I've been around them over in Jackson for several years now, and, and they never, I never had any close encounters uh, that were dangerous. Well, one day I had a hunter, and we had our snow machines parked, and my dogs were trailing a lion underneath, and a big lion come out of the Yellowstone Park and kill the moose. And I just showed him the kill. Well, with that bull was a cow and she was all mad. 
and she had her mane all down, all had her head down, and she just started lowing and coming up there. And this guy said, what are we going to do? I says, we're probably going to get in trouble. He says, well, I'm leaving. And he jumped on his snow machine and took off through just a bunch of brush because there was no trail. We're up there, we're listening to my dogs. And so when he left, I was standing between them. It left me exposed. And I'm in four feet of snow. I took one step and I went up to here. I couldn't move. And all these thoughts came through my mind. I said, well, this is how you got it. You always wondered, this is it. I mean, there was no, I had nothing. I had no protection. I had no, and she came. And she was about 18 inches away, still coming full. And that guy realized he'd left me in a bind and he turned around and he came back and he ran his machine against her side and, and, and ran over my leg. And it took the cow about four feet past me and then I grabbed a little limb and she went on. I, I know, the, and I, all I did is that I just uttered the Lord. Help me, Lord. I'm in trouble. And so I knew he saved me. I knew it. Because she was 1,500 pounds right here, and I'm to here, and her head's this far from me. I knew. So about two days later, I was going down the trail, and I thought, this would be a terrible place to meet a moose. And I went around the corner, and there was a moose and a calf. And I was in a narrow, winding trail. And there was no place for me to go and no place for her to go. And I sat there and I prayed for an hour. So she tried to walk away, but the calf was getting tired and she was getting madder and madder. And I sat there for one hour, which the one hour prayer doesn't hurt you, <laughs> you know? So I prayed. I, there was no, I couldn't physically lift this machine up and turn it around on this narrow trail. There was no place to go. I couldn't climb a tree. I just sat there praying. She went about 50 yards and finally she decided that she wasn't going to go anymore because her calf couldn't go. So she sat there lowing at me and, and throwing her mane down and I thought, well, I'm, I'm still in, I got in trouble again, you know, and I just prayed. And so she left about 50 yards and I moved up about 50 yards. Finally the calf, for some reason, got off the trail and she turned her head down and was looking off. And I, 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 I prayed the Lord would give me uh, safety here. And I crowded her the bank. And I think I hit her with my a forearm. And she could have kicked my head off. But she didn't. I, just, they, I got on by. So I knew again. And these are just an, a few of the things. One time I got stuck in a real bad avalanche. And I couldn't get me or my machine out in my... Uh, the avalanche had covered us up and I knew it wouldn't go and I knew I couldn't dig it out without sliding so if I created the void to get my machine out I was going to create uh, let this above me slide down and smother me and I, I sit there thinking about everything I could do and I thought well you didn't You didn't ask for help. And I asked the Lord to help me. And the machine buried, started, and pulled out of that. It's impossible. If you've ever been on one, they won't do that. They won't do it. And and it started and and it went ahead and it's it's not even a powerful machine. But anyway, the Lord took me out of it and I wanted to witness of those things before I began and that's last winter that's just last winter I would like to pray a minute Our kind, gracious Heavenly Father. 
I thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We're so unworthy, Lord. I ask, Lord, as I attempt to give witness of those things that I've seen and heard about Brother Branham, that you'll bring the things to to my memory that are pleasing to you. May they be accurate, Lord. It's been a long time. Help me, Lord Jesus, that I may say the right thing. And if you sent me here, as I believe you did, may your your purpose be accomplished. And Lord, bring those things to my memory accurately that I I have need to say this morning. And bless to those that may hear it and be with us and may your presence be with us. Forgive us for our shortcomings. Be with us throughout this day. Bless your bride around the world and we'll give the praise in Jesus Christ's name. I I apologize. I have some notes here I want to refer to and I'm not a speaker, and I will blunder around here, but if you'll bear with me, I maybe I can bring up some of these things here and, and give witness. I first met Brother Branham when I was seven years old. I didn't meet him, excuse me, I was in my first meeting when I was seven years old. and We were in Baldwin Park, California. The year was 1947. We came and sat toward the rear of the building. My grandmother was in Arkansas. She was a Pentecostal lady and a, and a real Christian. and She had lived her life uh, raising 14 children. My mother was one, seven girls and seven boys. And she had heard of, she couldn't go because she had so many children, she couldn't go to the the meetings in Arkansas at the time in Russellville so she heard a lot of her friends and so she sent word to my dad and mother in California dad got drafted into the Navy and he had to go uh, work in California he said if you ever get a chance to hear this man some wonderful things happened so dad he had only been a Christian about it two years, maybe a year and a half. Mother had been a Christian the whole time, and my dad had had to backslidden and was in the world, and he had just come in and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the Pentecostal Church, and so they took us to these, this meeting, and a little girl sat in front of us, and, and she was uh, maybe a year or two younger than I, and she had horribly crossed eyes, just horribly crossed, and a pretty little girl, and I just had empathy for her in my heart. I thought, oh, the poor little girl. Ne- never did I know she had a prayer card. I didn't know that. I thought, oh, this poor little girl, and she's looking around back over the seat, and they were just very crossed, you know. And so when she went across the platform and came back, and she said, she turned around and they were perfectly straight. And that was the first striking thing that I remember in Brother Branham's meetings. And as he would get in the area, we would go, my my dad and mother would take us to those meetings for the next few years. And so we became acquainted with, with Brother Branham's healing ministry. We didn't know he was the messenger of the hour we did not know there was a message we just liked to go to the meetings and see the healings we didn't have any any knowledge of who he was and what he was sent for well and I was hunting uh, and I got to I I got to meet brother Billy we laughed and talked and I met him outside a lot and when we should have been in really but anyway, I got to meet knowing him. He was young, and, and 
anyway, he said, you know, my dad would really like to, uh, to meet you and go on a hunt with you. I said, oh, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> he wouldn't like to meet me. <laughs> no, that can't happen. I'm not a Christian, you know. And I said, uh, that's not what he'd enjoy at all. Well, one day I came. I'd been up on the San Carlos Indian Reservation, and I caught a really, really big bear. And I had this huge bear, one of the biggest ones I'd seen. Billy liked it, and Brother Billy, and he says, uh, oh, I got to tell Dad. So we went to Jim's Steakhouse down on Van Buren. That was the first time I got to, well, it was the second time. I was just, uh, uh, in 1959, uh, Brother Sherritt, the man on the tapes, you'll know, remember the name associated with the grafting of the, of the trees, the orange and the lemon. Well, John Sherritt, my dad was working with him at the time, and he came down to Phoenix and had just got a world record rainbow. And we saw it in the back of his car and in the, in the back of his station wagon. And we got to go to dinner with him that day. Of course, uh, we just sat there and be quiet. We didn't say anything, but we, we, did, we got to, uh, to go. He, he and Sister Mita and my mom and dad and I and uh, Brother Sheraton and his wife went out to eat at the Los Olivos Lodge there in Phoenix. That was a, a very wonderful time, a couple of hours there, maybe five or five, and, and Brother Shert, he had, he had a whole wing there set aside, and that was a, a, a delightful time. And but as far as interfacing with Brother Ben and myself, I did not. I didn't. I did other than just meeting him. And, and so the this time at Jim's Steakhouse is when I met him, and we set up a hunt to go to Strawberry. And quite a few things happened on that hunt. Uh, really, I I. I uh, I, uh, uh, quite uh, a lot of things, but uh, <clears throat> one of the things, that, one of the things that happened up there is uh, brother Billy and I were shooting at 22s, and, and I became aware of how really superior the brother Brennan could shoot. I I always thought before I met him, I used to think I might shoot a little. I know Jim Ed, he, he he thinks he can shoot too, but he he can't. No, and and and. Uh, <laughs> And, I, and I'm here to testify that I can't. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, he, he he put these uh, he he's, he he put these uh, empty 22 casings on stumps, and he would just shoot them into oblivion, free hand, off hand, and and you just do feats like that. He could strike a match. He could do all these things. Well, anyway, Brother Billy and I were shooting at a. Uh, I don't know if they have them anymore. I can't remember if they do. The old 22 cartridge, they had a red X on them, Super X, so the Winchester. And uh, we were shooting at the, at the X. Well, I think I missed one way, uh, plus or minus, Little and Billy missed the other way. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I mean Brother Billy. And, and uh, so uh, Brother Brown said, well, I might, I'll just... Uh, show you boys how to shoot and we we're just messing around the hunt was over and we we're just shooting and mess playing around and so he said well I can do two things here I can do you want me to shoot where the X intersects or do you want me to split your two shots I said well it's easy to hit the X just split our two shots so he took a little time and he shot, and we went down there. And you couldn't, you could have just measured him perfectly. He was exactly between our two shots, which put it off center of the X. But he did that type of, uh, of thing, and he was it just unbelievable how he could really shoot. I mean, it was it was gifted, you know. It was beyond regular accuracy. He was just really so. Uh, I don't know if I have any notes on that hunt or not. I don't think I do. Oh, I, I, one of the first times that after, uh, uh, that first time the, uh, the four of us went, Bro Brother uh, Branham and my father and Brother Billy and I. And after that, uh, the mo all the times except two, 
All the other hunts that I was with him, except two of them, we were alone because he did it for one reason, and that was to rest and get away. And, of course, I was young, and I wasn't a Christian, and I, the thought came to me many times, I wonder why he puts up with going with me. And I really know why, you know, he would talk, he would be tired from the... the uh, uh, not only the meetings got him tired and worn out, but he had a lot of personal interviews, and they would just wear him out and get his body and his mind tired and weak and worn out, and he wanted to rest. And so he could come up there, and I didn't ask him any spiritual questions because I wasn't spiritual. <laughs> so he didn't break over into that realm. And he could really tell me hunting stories, and I, I've been known to tell one or two. And <laughs> so, you know, I just told hunt stories. Of, I used to hang around with a bunch of government hunters, uh, lion hunters in Utah. So I, I knew a lot of famous people. Most of them are d dead. And, uh, but they, at that time, they weren't. And, <laughs> and I, I told him all, a bunch of stories, and, and, uh, and he'd like to tell me about his hunts, which I just loved. I sincerely loved them. Yeah. I mean, I loved his African stories, his, his, his Canadian stories, and his squirrel hunts. I, he, I could, he could tell me about a squirrel hunt. I had just as much fun as I did an African hunt, you know. But anyway, I, I realized that he was using it to rest. And, and, and another thing I noticed, he, when he'd be tired, he wouldn't hardly eat when we first. Maybe only half a cup of coffee and part of pick at the food. And after three or four days, after laughing and sitting up till uh, late at night, he would be, eat full course meals. But at first, he might couldn't even half a piece of toast. He didn't eat much. He was very tired, very worn. And many times, uh, a lot of people will never know how physical and how double tough he was. He would sit up telling me stories till two or three. We'd get up at four or five. And we would walk 30 miles. And I was in my prime. You've got to remember, I was young, and I could trot all day. I could trot. Literally hit a long trot all day long, up and down. Here he's 49, 50 when I met him, and up to about 56 there. I mean, you know, he, he could walk a young man in, into the ground. He was extremely, extremely uh, physical. And yet, he'd be tired and worn out, and he would do these types of things. And it, it amazed me, his stamina, and how uh, uh, one, one time, which brings me to mind of, of, of a story, maybe I have it in here. I don't know if I do. Uh, we were up at Strawberry. No, we were in the control road, uh, Pine. We were at Pine. And... Uh, we had a bunch of lions in, in a bunch. There were there was three or four, and they went everywhere. Dogs went everywhere, went up to the Boy Scout camp, went up to Milk Ranch Points. They went up on the Pine Creek Trail, and I took off running. And I ran in, Man, and that's Manzanita up in there, and if you've ever been in there, Manzanita, you can't see any tracks. There's no, uh, it's heavy, it's thick, you have to crawl through it. You know, Manzanita doesn't bend. You have to do the bending, because it, it is where it is. And you crawl through that stuff, and it barks you, and it tears your clothing, and it's rough. And then the leaves fall down, and it has a mat of leaves, and you can't track. You can't even tell anything. So I had I'd gone about, I think it's about seven miles by the way of the road to a Boy Scout camp, and a lion and the dogs would run through the Boy Scout camp, and they had all the kids in the, in the, uh, in the mess hall. Well, I thought, and my dogs were treed up on this big rim, and I thought, well, I better go back and get Brother Branham because he don't have any clue where I am because I've been gone several hours running and there's no way in the world that he knows because he can't trail me. Even though he's a good tracker, I knew he was a good tracker, but he couldn't track me. And here I have come through side hills and ridges and, and, and brush for six or seven road miles, which is probably nine or 10 or 11 miles the way I went. And so I started going backwards and I looked way up there and I saw Brother Branham. He was about two miles away. And I thought, man, he's about where I was. And I just sat down and I watched him. And he walked everywhere I went. And he came up to me. 
I couldn't believe it. I could not believe my eyes. Here he came through untrackable waste, and he went exactly, and I knew where I was. I knew where I went, because I tried to pick the best, and I knew where I'd go the same one again, you know. I couldn't believe it. He came exactly up to me, and he smiled, and he said, you didn't think I'd get here, did you? I said, no, sir, I didn't. <laughs> well, let me tell you something about, uh, I'm going to jump back two hours. I had had two dogs that I knew nothing about. A man called me up and asked me to try them out. And I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know if they were good lion dogs. I didn't know if they, were, if they chased deer. I didn't know what. Well, when I, my dogs were running on this lion track, and these two dogs took a fox. And I knew they did. I saw the fox. And they caught the fox and killed it. And I thought, boy, that's fast. You know, they may not be any good, but they sure are fast. And they killed this fox, and it was about a quarter of a mile off of this trail that I picked to go follow my dogs. Then I heard them again. They jumped the, there was a pair of foxes. They jumped the other fox and killed it, and it was about an, another eighth of a mile away. And this just down in the weeds, down in the brush. I said, well, they're good fox dogs, you know. And I was kind of amazed that they could catch a fox and kill it. And I didn't say, you know, no, of course. I talked to him, and he said, you didn't think I'd be here? I said, no, sir, I sure didn't. He said, boy, wasn't that something about those fox? It's humanly impossible for him to know where that fox was. I was right there, so I could see it. And if I hadn't stepped down where it was, I wouldn't have seen it. He said, that was something about those foxes, wasn't it? And you can imagine what it did to me. You can just imagine. I just, you know, I just tumbled in my mind all day long. Just tumbled over and over. I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't grasp it. I just knew something different here that I ever even imagined. If anybody ever thinks, and they, you hear these people talk about Brother Branham when he was under the anointing, they don't know very much about that, you know. He, 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 you know, the Lord was with him all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yes. And he knew a lot of things all the time. Oh, one time, the first morning that Brother Brandon and I went, was going from uh, Payson the first day by ourselves. The, nobody else was with us the uh, first time. We got stopped and checked by game warden. Now, I go months without it, maybe years. And this, and, but Brother Branham had an uh, out-of-state license because he was from Indiana. He hadn't moved to Arizona at the time. And uh, so he had an out-of-state license, so he was legal. I had my guide's license. I had my hunt. We were all legal. And so he checked us. We got out and and put our stuff on the hood of the truck and visit with him a little. And the guy's name was John Hernbrod. And he was really uh, aggressive, you might say, and a, pretty much of a smart aleck for a game warden, you know. And so we went out, and I was starting to get irritated, and Brother Branham told me to calm down. And I, was, I wasn't very calm then, and <laughs> I wasn't old, you know, and fat. <laughs> but... Anyway, uh, I, he said, telling me to slow down and calm down and be nice. And I was getting, he was kind of, he was harassing us, really, what he was doing. So we went on, and that afternoon, he did it. He stopped us again. I said, you checked us this morning. You know he's from Indiana. You know we got everything. We don't have to show Brother Brown said, just show it to him. I said, we don't have to do this. He said, it's just be calm. <laughs> he says, how long does it take to show him your license? I said, well, I'm not going to show him it. <laughs> I said, he read it this morning. He's not that stupid. You know, he's sitting there listening. And so I, he said, show him your license. So we did. And I, I was aggravated at the guy, you can imagine. Yeah. So we went on. Well, the next day, he started following us. 
So I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. That guy can't even think about walking with us. Let's just lead him along through the... I said, we're going to go to Washington Park, and the rim's about 2,000 feet there, and let's climb it two or three times. And drop off and climb it, and let him follow us. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to lead this guy, and we'll get this guy. He said, well, we might catch a lion. I said, all right. So we took our dogs, and we, this guy's following us, and we came back. We're about 10 miles ahead of him. And he had to be tired, man. He had to be tired. So I said, I'm going to cut his tires. He said, you can't do that. I said, yeah, I'm going to cut his tires, you know, because he's following us, trying to get us trapped. And I said, I'm cutting these tires. He, I said, he won't get back for a week because he's probably got one spare, but he don't have four. <laughs> he said, no, 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 you can't do that, you know. And so I was wanting to cut his tires and, and some other stuff, too. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you can't do that. I said, all right. He said, I went, I went over there, and I looked at, right by the truck, and I saw this lion track. And I hadn't seen it that morning. It was real big. It was really big. And so I was looking at this lion track. I said, look at this. I said, we didn't hit him anywhere today. Look at this lion. This is a nice tom. And he looked at me real funny, you know, and he says, uh, how old is it? I said, well, I don't know. It's old, several days. I said, I'm not sure. I said, let me get this one dog. I had this dog named Boots. I said, Boots can smell the oldest track of all my dogs. I'll just, uh, just let him smell it. So I put him on it, and he could barely get some sin out of it and wag his tail. And I said, it might be 10, year, 10 days old. He looked at me real serious, and this was another shock to me. He says, it's exactly 10 days old. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> anyway, I was just j guessing, you know. I said, I don't know, it might be 10 days old. He said, it's exactly 10 days old. So another thing, too, he told me, I, I, he said, who's your best dog? I said, Boots. He said, he's not your best dog. He said, what about Eli? I said, he's my second best dog. He says, well, you just start watching him. He said, Boots steals everything Eli does. And I started watching it, and he was copycatting the, old, the other dog. And I had no, here I'm supposed to be the one that knows about the dogs, right? I, I got to look, and I didn't even know my own dogs, you know? <laughs> he had to tell me. Anyway, that. <clears throat> one, one, one day we were in the, here, here was a good, I got a, a good lesson in, in shooting one day, and it was snowing, we couldn't go hunting. So we're shooting out the window of the, of the lodge. <laughs> we're target practicing, I'm trotting over here and putting our targets on this tree. And so he said, uh, he said, go 50 paces and put this 22 Magnum casing into the bark with the, the, uh, cart the casing backwards to me. So I went over there and pressed this 22 casing. It's 50, 50 yards. He stands in the door of the lodge offhand, and he drills this casing into the bark. I mean, it just disappeared. I trot back over there, and I says, yeah, I, I can't find it. He said, put another one up there. So I trotted over there, put another one. He did the same thing. He said, here, you try it. I said, oh, that's out of my deal. That's out of my league. So I stuff one in there, and I get his gun. And it was a little bull barrel, 22 Magnum Custom, single shot he had made. And it would really shoot, you know, for him. So I held up there, and I'm trying my very best to get my best shot. And I got alongside this casing, and I bent it. But it was still there, and the hole was beside it. And I was impressed. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I was impressed that I even touched it, you know. And I went, and we, he walked over there and he says, don't feel bad. <laughs> I, I says, I don't feel bad, I feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he was consoling me on my bad shooting, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I remember, I remember he said, don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One time, you know, I, I, I kind of hate to say it. Well, a lot of this I do, but I'm going to because I feel like it. But I do have something in common with Brother 
too mad. My mama was praying for us boys, my brother and I. We weren't doing too good. We weren't doing very good. And so one time, Brother Branham came to the house, and he would usually, when he got out of meetings or if he was out of the interviews and he was tired, he wanted to rest, I, I told him I'd cancel all my hunters and he could come and I'd just take him. Cause I, and of course, I never uh, charged him any money. I mean, I was just a kid and trying to make a living, but I, I didn't have any money, but I sure didn't want his money. I, I can tell you that. I don't care how broke I was, I didn't want a dollar of that. And so I would never take anything. And, and I, did, I was so waiting on the next time to see him that I couldn't hardly wait. And I, could, so, and I didn't know why I'll necessarily. I just knew I couldn't hardly wait to see him again. So if he called, I said, no, I don't have any hunters. And I'd say, you got to go home. He said, what do you mean go home? I paid you. I said, you go home. I'll get you later. And I'd just be rude to these guys. I didn't know how to take care of clients, you know. And I say, you gotta get, you gotta leave. He said, "What do you mean leave? I'm hunting. I got a five-day hunt." I said, "No, you, I, I, something's come up. You gotta go." Brother Brown say, "Somebody in camp?" I said, "Nope, nobody's here. Come on, hurry." <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, he came down to the house, and my mother was talking to him, and she was talking to nervous about us and crying, you know. And I didn't know if she said it. She told me later, and said, uh, telling him about it. What should she do? And he said, just don't nag him. Yeah. He said, uh, he, he said, uh, they'll be there. Right. You don't have to worry. He said, they'll be there, but don't nag them. Yeah. And no matter what you do and where you go and what happens, I mean, I know we still all have to come to the same message. We all have to come to that word. And none of us are exempt from it. You've got to have the Holy Ghost in your life or you're not going to make it. I tried it a long time with a head knowledge and you can't do it. You have to have Christ in your heart. And you've got to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ or you won't. You won't get there. But it's still a wonderful consolation to, to, to know he said it. It doesn't excuse my bad doing or mistakes I've made. It doesn't lessen any of that. We have to pay for everything we do, and we'll pay many times. So, oh, the price is great. But still, what a consolation deep down when you know it's priceless <clears throat> anyway he said some more things and one blessing that our family all of my father and my mother and my brother and my sister and I every one of us has had visions from Brother Branham pertaining to our lives. That's such a blessing in itself. Every single member of my family have been touched through the prophetic word of our messenger. And that's a wonderful privilege also, and I wanted to mention that and how thankful I am for that. My brother, one time, my brother was going to go and the doctor was going to cut on him for. No. Am I taking too much time? No. No. Is he taking too much time? No. There's your answer. My brother was in the hospital and they were going to cut on him for a hernia. And Brother Branham called me up. And he said, look, don't let them cut on your brother. He doesn't even have a hernia. That's nerves. And he was already in the hospital. So I called down there. I said, Joe, don't let him operate. You don't have a hernia. He said, what do you mean? I said, Brother Branham said, you got, that's, your nerves are doing that. I said, don't let them cut on you. You don't even have one. So he went home. My brother went home. And he was, he was supposed to have this operation the next morning. 
And he told, see, we would have never known. No. We'd have never known. And they wouldn't have told us he didn't have one. No, they wouldn't. You know, they wouldn't have told us. And it wouldn't have done one thing, you know. But anyway, they told, he told him that. And uh, I, I'm not going to get into my sisters uh, that he did give uh, a, a vision about her. And uh, I won't get into that or, or, or my mother and my, my dad. But another time, <laughs> I, I wanna, this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, there was a trio. There was a trio, and they were, there was a mother and two daughters, and they, they were all old maids living way out by Wickenburg, uh, Morristown. They lived out by Castle, Castle, Castle Hot Springs. That's where it is. They lived way out, and they were really primitive women. They were nice, and, and they sang bluegrass. And they, uh, one of them played a dobro, and one a mandolin, and one a guitar, and they could really sing good. I mean, they could sing good if you like that kind of music, and I did. Well, Brother Branham said, hey, uh, you know where they live? I said, yeah, they don't have a telephone. They don't even have any electric. I said, they I can tell you right now, they don't have a telephone. They don't even have power, you know. He said, can you get them? I said, yeah, it's, it's not very far. I'll go get them. He said, well, I want them to sing at the Christian businessmen's deal at their motto because those women, those businessmen and women don't like them, and they won't have them call on them. So what you do, you have them over here in the wing, and I'll call on them. I said, all right. So I go out their house, and I said, you guys, uh, Brother Brown wants you to sing. And I'll tell you what song it is. He mentions it on tape several times, and I'll think of it in a minute. I'd like to talk it over. Yeah. Okay, that's who was singing it. That's who they did it. So I went out there, and they were kind of country, you know, and, and they dressed pretty, kind of like me, you know, pretty plain. I started to apologize this morning about how I dressed, but that'd be hip hypocritical because the clothes I got home are the same. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I went and got these ladies, and, and uh, they, I like to hear them sing too. And so I got them over there in the wing. So Brother Branham goes out, and he said, before I... Uh, speak this morning. I want to hear it have some people sing. <laughs> and here they come out. These old, these old ta ta women were did just eyes roll back and they looked, oh no. Yeah. But anyway, they came out and sang. It was good. So in the in the, in the after after he spoke, he was in the wing and my brother and I. Yeah, you know, okay, we we're standing there and my brother always remembers us. This is why I'm relating it. It's because it, it was so striking to my brother. Because that morning it had a lot of emotions and manifestations and a lot of tongues and, and interpretations. And my brother and I were standing there. And he said, remember, he said, salvation only comes from the word not all these manifestations. And my brother has never forgotten, nor I have never forgotten that. He, it was simple. At the time, we've heard it over and over now, but at that time, we hadn't heard that like that, you know? I mean, it was striking to us. Well, now, if you hear, if you read a lot, hear a lot of tapes, you hear that a lot, but we didn't hear that a lot, you know? And that was still when they believed in initial evidence and everything else, you know? He said that salvation just comes from the word and that alone. Amen. He said, and not manifestations. He said you can't and, and, and he said you can't put any any importance on that. It, it, it's kind of the way he put that. <clears throat> One time I was up in Utah with Brother Renum. This friend of mine had just lost a child and he's needing some money and he needed the, the money for the for the funeral. So he called me up and so I was gonna help him. And so I was talking to, to Brother Renham about it and he said uh, I said, I don't know, I need to either buy this colt from him or buy a lion dog. He needs some money real bad and he won't take a gift. He will he's too proud. 
he was a lion hunter and he was trying to feed a family and then lion hunters, the government lion hunters made 600 a month and he had five children. And that was what they were working for then at that time uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And I said, he's way too proud, but he won't. It's the same man, by the way, if you hear the tape uh, when he talks about the Jack Mormon. Yeah. Same gentleman, yeah. same gentleman. And we were at his house and I said, what do you think I ought to do? He said, well, you ought to get that dog. And I said, all right. So he said, let's go down to the saddle shop. I said, why? He said, you know that story you told me about your saddle? You got in a bind and got out of money and you sold your saddle a long time ago? I said, yeah. He said, I think it might be in that saddle shop over downtown. <laughs> I said, that, that was four or five years ago. Uh, and, and it was about 60 miles from here, you know? He said, well, let's just go over there and have a look. And I walked in and my saddle sitting there on the draft, you know? <laughs> and I thought, he said, well, that's pretty reasonable, isn't it? Well, let's just get it. <laughs> and I got my saddle back after all those years. And then, so I go back home, and, and, and Jerry says, why don't you take the colt? Brother Branham nudges me. He just told me to take the, the dog. And I thought, well, Jerry said, I'd rather you take the dog. Boy, I need that dog. Brother Branham nudges me. I said, I... Ah, I think I better take that dog. And he said, so he, he said, well, think about it. I said, all right. So that afternoon he said, take, will you take this horse? I said, yeah, I'll take it. And Brother Brandon, the room that he said, I think I'd have taken the dog. Well, I'll tell you right now that I won't go into a long story, but that colt had one problem after another and ended up crippled. <laughs> And the dog went to a real good friend of mine, and he was good. And every day of his life, I, I envied him. <laughs> every 10, 12 years, I wish I had that dog. <laughs> anyway, I didn't listen, <laughs> and I should have. Uh, one time, I'll tell you how dumb I was. I, of course, everybody, that's pretty apparent anyway. But I was really foolish. Brother Branham's trying to give me a hint. I dove hunted with Bob Ford. I don't know if you ever any of you know Bob Ford in uh, Jeffersonville. Uh, old man. Name, yes. He looks like Colonel Sanders. Yeah. But you don't have chicken. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, Bob and I, we went good dove hunting every day. And so Brother Brown, he didn't like it. See, but I didn't know it. Nobody had ever told me. Sure. And 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 we and I had an old man that had the palsy from Fran, uh, France, and been in World War One, and he, and I gave him the doves. And I thought I was doing a good duty, and I'd take a couple of young ones, give him, I think the limit might have been 20, 22, 20, 20 a day, I guess. Well, I'd take about two and have mom cook them for my breakfast, and I would just give him the rest. And him and his wife would eat on them, and I thought it was a good deal. I was just, give, you know, and so Brother Branham was trying to tell me, and he says, you know, we, we don't shoot doves. I said, I do. <laughs> oh, and then about halfway home, I thought, oh, you dummy. You dummy, he's trying to tell you something. So I go to Bob Forbes and I say, oh, Bob, we can't hunt doves anymore. He said, well, you may not, but I'm going to. He said, why? I said, Brother Brown said, we don't hunt doves. I said, I'm not going to shoot any more doves. He said, well, I'm going to. I said, okay, because he's stubborn as I was, you know, and kind of cantankerous and, and, and everything. And so I said, well, he was. Yeah, he was. I mean, he's not now. He's, a, he's in the message and everything now, but he was, he was kind of raunchy then. I remember he used to get after people with shovels and knives and stuff. You know, he was pretty neat. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, uh, he said, well, I'm not quitting. So when I saw Brother Brown, I said, man, I, I, I said, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't try to understand what you're trying to tell me about the does. I, I won't shoot any more. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, and he was telling me about the dove, the Holy Spirit's like a dove. Yeah. So we're standing out there, and he said, it's, it's like the, you got this dove on your shoulder, and if you do something, he sits, the Holy Spirit's sensitive, and if you offend it, he'll fly up on this little limb, but he won't be far. Yeah. But then you get everything right, and he'll come back. And he went just like this. And so... I, rea I didn't realize he was trying to tell me that the representative of the Holy Spirit, and I'm here I'm just blazing away at him, you know. And 
So I was gonna I couldn't wait to tell my dad. And so Dad, he was too tight to buy the shells, so it didn't he didn't have to worry. He won't buy any shotgun shells, they're too high. <laughs> but anyway, I was gonna tell dad just in case he did, you know, uh, break loose with a few shackles. I was gonna tell him we can't do it, you know. And so I was, I was standing, Dad had a trailer park in South Phoenix at the time, and we're standing outside working on something. And I said, Dad, you know, Brother Brown, and I told him, I was telling my dad this story. I said, Brother Brown was telling me about not shooting doves, and I said, I just blustered right over, well, I do. And then I had to apologize, and then I said, let me, here, here's what he was telling me. Well, and, and, and please, brothers and sisters, I, 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 of all people, I won't try to make something of myself. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just witnessing what happened. And I don't, I'm not trying to be something, you know, because I know I'm not. But as I was telling my dad this story, you know in Arizona we, that you have Sonora doves, and you've got morning doves, and then you've got white wings. But a pure white dove landed on my shoulder. My dad looks at me, and I was afraid to move. And he says, is that a pet? And I says, no, Dad, I had never seen it before. And it flew up to a limb. And he says, my. And it flew back and landed on my shoulder. He said, what's the deal? I said, I don't know. I don't know. And then it flew away. And you know, I don't think we talked about it for about 12 years or 15. My dad says, do you ever remember that white dove? He said, did you ever think about that? I said, I think about it quite a bit, Dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Sometimes, you know, we can be blustering through and not be sensitive enough for things, you know. And yeah. I was pretty bad about that and made you, th made you think how callous we can be, you know, and how thought thoughtless. Right. <clears throat> One time I was in... Uh, You want to quit? No. Okay. Well, you just don't. Because there's a bunch of... I haven't even hardly got down to the line. One time I was in Strawberry Lodge, and it was cold. And I had an old International Scout. And if anybody ever had them, they have the lousiest defroster known to man. It takes about 35, 40 minutes if it's a frosted day. And I had this old scout, and I'd already loaded the dogs, and so I had a great big wart on my thumb. It was, and it wasn't hurting. It was just a nervous habit I had, and I was sitting there wanting this. It was about 4.35 in the morning, and we're sitting there and waiting on this defroster and everything, and and I'm rubbing, I got that nervous habit. And I'm thinking, you know, I wish this thing would hurry up. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, nothing, it's just a dumb habit. In a couple of minutes, I was doing it again, and I didn't know it, you know. He said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. And pretty soon, the third time, he reached over, and he took my thumb like that. That's all he did. He didn't say one word. When he took his hand off, I didn't have a wart there. And it's been a slick, and I never had it, and never came back, and there's no scar there either. It was just gone. And all he did is touch it, he never said one thing. It was gone. And I just sit there and looked. And I looked at him. He just smiled. It was gone, you know. So the next day, we went down through a barn. I, we were staying in number four room at Strawberry Lodge, 
Lester Gray, this guy that had managed Strawberry Lodge, was a real good friend of mine. And I would run a ticket for every hunter. And when I, my hunter would pay, I would pay my ticket because we'd get our meals there, have our room, get our flats fixed. Because <laughs> I had a lot of flats. <laughs> and we would get gas and everything. And then I'd just get my hunt, pay up with him, and go to the next person. Well, Strawberry, it was strawberry at that time, uh, it, it had... Uh, he had a barn down below, and I kept my dogs in the straw. So when I went by this one dog I had, he was an Airedale dog named Hobo. He was begging to go, and he'd been real sick, and he was passing blood, and I knew he was weak, and he couldn't eat. And he was, I thought he was going to die, and I wouldn't let, I'd always let him go. But that day he begged to go, and I said, uh, you can't go today. And he cried a real pitiful cry, and I walked on by, and Brother Branham stopped by him. He just stopped. I selected the other dogs I was going to take that day, and usually I rest, take one pack and rest the other half, and then the next day I reverse them so they're always fresh. And he said, why don't you let him go? I said, I can't. He's sick. He's not going to make it. He's too weak to make the day. If we get on a long chase, he won't even make it back, and he's too heavy to carry, and I don't want to carry him. And I don't, I'm just not going to take him. I went on through and let my dogs loose, and he's still standing there. He said, why don't you let him go? I said, let him go. So he unsnaps him. I went outside, put him in the scout, and we went to where we're hunting. And the dog got out to clean out, and he was just quivering and shaking and passing blood. And I said, I was kind of telling him, I, said, I was kind of getting, letting, explaining to him why I wasn't going to let the dog. I said, see, that's why I didn't bring him. And he walked over to him like this. And he put his hand right over his hips. And he, he didn't say anything. And he said he'll be all right. And that dog, he was five. That dog lived when I was, he was 11. At six o'clock one night, I was with a rancher, and the rancher shot a lion in a low cedar tree, and he didn't do a very good job. And the lion jumped on me, and Hobo went up and took the lion's bite in front of my throat. And the lion killed him at 11, and he never had another sick day until the day the lion killed him. And he saved me at that at that age of 11. And Brother Ben just touched him and said he'd be all right. And he, my dog was healed. He went on that day, never missed another meal. And and I and he told me never sell the dog. I didn't tell you that too. He said don't ever sell that dog. I said I, I said I won't. And and I and that, that that's what he told me that day. He said don't ever sell that dog. Amen. You know good and well what he saw. Yeah. He saw it sitting in the barn before I wouldn't take him. He really saw it then. One time, one of the two times, other than that first time I told you, the only two times that anybody else went, was once with Alan Mosley and once with Welch Evans. But the Mosleys were my friends and they, we were visiting a lot and they had asked me to go with Brother Branham. And I said, well, I know, you know, a lot of people ask me that and I'm not trying to keep you from him or anything, but he only told me not to ever tell anybody where and when we're going and not to give his number to anybody and never tell anybody and I never have and I never will. But they were good friends and as you know they had given Brother Branham the Jeep. They had made a Jeep and given it to him. And they loved him dearly and they, they talked to me often. And Alan was one of my bosom friends before he was killed. And so he says, why don't you ask him? I said, I will. 
And I loved the other boys too, but I did like Alan better. You know how you are, you just have some people you just get along with a little better. And, and the other boys are fine boys too, not to say they aren't. But I just really did like Alan and got along with him a lot. And he, I don't know, he said, well, tell Alan he can go. I said, all right. I said, but he's seeding rice up in Northern California, but he's going to fly down and meet us in Utah whenever I tell him. I said, he said, well, don't have him come now because there's going to be a real bad storm. And it was just perfectly sunny, you know. He said, there's going to be a real bad storm and he couldn't fly in there. I said, all right, I'll tell him. I said, Alan, you, you can go, but you can't come. <laughs> <laughs> He says, what do you mean? He said, I'm coming. I said, no. And he says, I'll, I can fly in any weather. I said, no, don't come. So Brother Branham came and met me over here at the house and parked his Jeep out in front. And then we always put the dogs in my truck and then we leave. And uh, that day, my mother had a pot of chili on and she said, he never came in. We usually just met outside and leave. And he says, she said, I got a new apple pie done, or cherry, I don't remember which, and a, and a pot of chili. Asked him if he wants a bowl before you go, so you don't have to stop along the way. And I said, I don't think he will, but I'll ask him. He said, yeah, look, yeah, that'd be all right. So we went in, and, and he sat there and he told me, he said, you know, I, something's going to happen on this trip that I'm not going to like. I'm not going to enjoy it. I said, well, Brother Ram, that's easy. Let's just don't go. <laughs> I said, I don't want you to not be happy. He said, oh, you don't understand. If you see a vision, it has to happen. We couldn't help not going if we wanted to. I already saw it. It's going to happen. I said, well, let's just stay home. No, that didn't help work, see. I, I was just going to just why, why, save him the unhappiness but he said no we have to go or then it's going to be wrong so he told me what it was two things and so we went to Utah and it was real pretty pretty all the way up there nice and sunny and we got in this little room and he gave me a book now this might seem strange to you here I'm with the prophet but he gives me a book and I can't put the book down and I'm right there. I'm, we're, on two, we're on twin beds. I could have talked to him one of my hearts, but I, was, I couldn't put this book down. A prophet visits South Africa. I can't believe this. Man. And I'm reading this book, and he's right there. And, and he, he said, well, you can read that later. I said, no, no, I can't. <laughs> but anyway, I remember him giving me that, and, and, and I couldn't put it down. So I told, he said, uh, you call Alan and tell him not to come because he's going to be antsy and going to come anyway. So I called him in California. I says, you better not uh, come. He says, it, is it storming? I said, nope, it's very pretty. He said, I'm on my way. I said, you better not. So he called the weather service, and they said it was fine. He called me back. I'm coming. I said, no, you better, you better, you can't. You can't come, Alan. He said, man, I waited for this, and I waited for it, and I'm coming. I said, no, you better not. So he didn't. And sure enough, we woke up about midnight and it was about a foot of snow already <laughs> and it was thick it was one of those horizontal blizzards he couldn't have made it 10 feet you know well anyway I called him when it settled down and he came on down and and we got this line well I'd found a little set of line tracks and I said and I knew brother Brandon was wanting a bigger one and so if we got a small one he'd just pass on it anyway so I figured why should I tree it so we went all day long, caught a bobcat, and it was too little, and we let it go. And that night, I said, well, we got that lion track. We can go run it for fun if you want to. It's little, but it's the only thing we found today. He didn't say anything, and Alan said, yeah, let's go do it. He didn't say anything, and I didn't pick up on it, you know, and so I went over and turned my dogs on it and treat it, and Alan had a big old gun there, and he shot a big hole in it, and he didn't like it. It was a pretty little lion. It was just a year then. So I thought, I, he said, well, I'm not going to take that little line. I said, well, I know that. But Alan said, I'll take it. I said, he said, I'd like to have it. I said, all right, take it. So the next night, there was two of them. And I knew that that <clears throat> sibling 
would be looking for its its uh, mate there the next day. So we went hunting the next day, didn't find any lion. I said, well, that other lion will be right there. I mean, I didn't can catch it tonight. It was kind of on the way back into the motel. So I stopped by, dumped my dogs out and treated it. Well, I decided I'd just have some fun. So I climbed up in this tree and kicked this lion out. And uh, I just kicked it in the chest and knocked it out. And I felt so bad. I'm down there hissing my dogs and they're choking this lion. And you know, Brother Branham, he, he liked things killed humanely and yes. quickly. And my dogs are choking it and I'm down there hissing them and everything. And it fires your dogs up, see? So I'm down there training dogs, and I looked up, and he had a bad look on his face. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. He don't like this. But he already told me he wouldn't like it. And I'm down there letting him choke this line. And I couldn't get him off then. As you know, you can't undo it. It's already a big mess. It's a big wreck. You know, what could I do? I couldn't undo it. I just had to take my medicine, you know. I thought, oh, man, he's mad at me, you know. Anyway, so I just goofed up. But anyway, they killed that lion. So I realized he didn't like it. And he told me later, he said, I, you know, I like them killed where they don't suffer, you know. Just if you're going to kill something, give, kill it, you know, don't do that. He said, that thing choked for 20 or 30 minutes, and you were liking it. I said, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sorry, you know. Anyway, so anyway. So he kind of got after me about that deal. So I, I learned about that. And... I'm going to pass over some of this because I know it's long, but let, let me, I give one, I, I, I'll do one more. This is very striking to me. In 1965, the construction strike hit here in Arizona, and my brother and I were working road construction, and we're out of work, and I got a chance to go to Oregon to hunt bear for the Forest Service, so I just went up there and hunted, hunted bear, and somebody has to do it, you know. And uh, so I went up there, and it, uh, killing these bear out of the fur forest, and <clears throat> I had missed Brother Brown because see, it's a first period of a long time that I didn't get to be with him, and I've been up there uh, all summer. And I want to describe this situation, and you'll see why it's so striking to me. I was, my brother was married, I was single. My brother had a wife and a daughter. And they had a little house in Gresham, Oregon, between Gresham and Mount Hood. And I had my dogs tied to under some pear trees, and they had a lean-to on the back, which was kind of my way, you know. And I lived in this utility lean-to. I had a cot, and, you know, what else do you need, you know? And so I lived in this, me and the hot water heater out there in this little deal, and uh, in the back of the house. And my sister-in-law would do my laundry and cook for me, and, and then I'd, I, I'd stand out there. Well, they lived on a hill, and up at the top of this hill, maybe 500 yards away, was a supermarket with a paved parking lot. And in the corner of the parking lot, out by the sidewalk, was a telephone booth. Well, I, would, I was laying there thinking, man, I'm going to go back to Arizona. I can't see Brother Branham. And I caught all these bears for the forest. There's no more bear up here in this forest. I'm going to go. And, and the construction strike wasn't over, and I didn't know I was going to make a living, but I decided I was going to go home. <coughs> and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was alone. I was kind of lonesome and stuff. And, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> I was sitting there. It's about 10 o'clock at night. And I was laying on my cot. And my sister-in-law came to the back door and she said, Dawson, you got somebody at the door. I said, there's no way. Nobody knows me. How could there be somebody at your door? No human in this whole town knows me. And nobody knows I live here and we don't have a telephone. She said, I don't know, but there's somebody asking for you. I said, well, Bonnie, I don't know anybody. I'm, I'm not getting up. She says, come to the door and see what he wants. So I go to the door, and this guy says, hey, you got a phone call up there at the parking lot. I said, I don't have a phone call. You're crazy. Nobody, I don't even know the number of my own self. 
He said, look, man, I don't care if you take it or not. I'm just walking by, and I don't even know why I answered it. I answered the phone, and he said, go down the hill and ask for Dawson. I said, you're out of your mind. He said, no, there's somebody up there. I said, who is I don't know who it is. Well, I don't even care if you answer it. You know, I said, well, I don't either. He said, but he did ask for you. Is your name God? I said, yeah. I said, all right. So I walk up this hill, and I pick up the phone, and Brother Billy said, said, Dawson, Daddy wants to talk to you. And he said, how are you doing? I said, pretty good. He says, no, you're not. He said, you're not doing very good, are you? I said, no, sir. He said, I was on my way to Canada, and I thought you needed a little cheering up. He said, uh, why don't you meet me down there, and let's go on another hunt pretty soon when I get back in Canada. I said, okay, sir, I will. And I just wanted to let you share that with you, you know. It was meant a lot, a lot to me. Well, I got two more pages. I don't even bother about that. That's enough time, my friend. I'm sorry I took that. No, don't oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a privilege being here with you, and, and I hope maybe somebody got something that would help you. And you pray for me, and I'm going to start my, other, my next season, and I obviously need a lot of prayer. <laughs> so I'd, appreciate, I'd covet your prayers, and God bless you very much. Good to see you.